This time we've got a mystery slash assessment story for you. One of us is lying. I hope you'll enjoy it. Only Simon never makes it out of that classroom. Before the end of detention, Simon's dead. And according to investigations, his death wasn't an accident. On Monday he died, but on Tuesday, he'd planned to post juicy reveals about all four of his high-profile classmates, which makes all four of them suspects in his murder. Or are they the perfect passires for a killer who's still on the loose? Part 1 Simon Says Chapter number 1 Bronway, Monday, September 24, 2.55 p.m. A sex tape, a pregnancy scare, two cheating scandals. And that's just this week's update. If all you knew of Bayview High was Simon Kelhurst's gossip app, you'd wonder how anyone found time to go to class. Old news, Brownie, says a voice over my shoulder. Wait till you see tomorrow's post. Damn, I hate getting caught reading about that, especially by its creator. I lower my phone and slam my locker shut. Whose life are you ruining next, Simon? Simon falls into step beside me as I move against the flow of students heading for the exit. It's a public service, he says with a dismissive wave. You do the raggy crawly, don't you? Wouldn't you rather know he has a camera in his bedroom? I don't bother answering. Me getting anywhere near the bedroom of perpetual stoner raggy crawly is about as likely as Simon growing a conscience. Anyway, they bring it on themselves. If people didn't lie and cheat, I'd be out of business. Simon's cold blue eyes take in my lengthening strides. Where are you rushing off to covering yourself in extra curricular glory? I wish. As if to taunt me, an alert crosses my phone. Metal at practice, 3 p.m. A parched coffee, followed by a text from one of my teammates. Evan's here. Of course he is. The cute mathlet, less of an oxymoron than you might think, seems to only ever show up when I can't. Not exactly, I say, as a general rule, and especially lately, I try to give Simon as less information as possible. We push through green metal doors to the back stairway, a dividing line between the dingness of the original Bayway High and its bright, airy new wing. Every year, more wealthy families get priced out of San Diego and come 15 miles east to Bayview expecting that their tax dollars will buy them a nicer school experience than popcorn ceiling and scarred linoleum. Simon's still on my heels when I reach Mr. Avery's lab on the third floor, and I half turn with my arms crossed. Don't you have some place to be? Yeah, detention, Simon says, and waits for me to keep walking. When I grab the knob instead, he bursts off laughing. You're kidding me, you too? What's your crime? I'm wrongfully accused. I mutter and yank the door open. Three other students are already seated, and I pause to take them in. Not the group I would have predicted, except one. Nate McAuley tips his chair back and smirks at me. You made a wrong turn? This is detention, not student council. He should know. Nate's been in trouble since fifth grade, which is right around the time we last spoke. The gossip mill tells me he's on probation with Bayview's finest for something. It might be a DUI, it might be drug dealing. He's a notorious supplier, but my knowledge is purely theoretical. Save the commentary, Mr. Avery checks something off on a clipboard and closes the door behind Simon. High arch windows leaving the back wall sends triangles of afternoon sun flashes across the floor, and faint sounds of football practice flowed from the field behind the parking lot below. I take a seat as Cooper Clay, who's thumbing a crumpled piece of paper like a baseball, whispers, heads up, Addie, and tosses it towards the girl across from him. Addie Prentice blinks, smiles uncertainly, and lets the ball drop to the floor. The classroom clock inches toward three, and I follow its progress with a helpless feeling of injustice. I shouldn't even be here. I should be at a potch coffee flirting awkwardly with Evan Naiman over differential equations. Mr. Avery is a give detention first, ask questions never kind of guy. But maybe there is still time to change his mind. I clear my throat and start to raise my hand until I notice Nate's marked broad name. Mr. Avery, that wasn't my phone you found. I don't know how it got into my bag. This is mine. I say, brandishing my iPhone in its melon-stripped case. 
Honestly, you'd have to be clueless to bring a phone to Mr. Avery's lab. He has a strict no-phone policy and he spends the first 10 minutes of every class rooting through the backpacks like he's head of airline security and we're all on the watch list. My phone was in my locker, like always. You too? Addie turns to me so quickly. Her shampooed hair swirls around her shoulders. She must have been surgically removed from her boyfriend in order to show up alone. That wasn't my phone either. May 3, Cooper chimes in. His thousand accent make it sound like a three. He and Eddie exchange surprised looks, and I wonder how this is new to them when they're part of the same clique. Maybe uber popular people have better things to talk about than unfair detentions. Somebody punked us. Salmon leans forward with his elbows on the desk, looking spring-loaded and ready to pounce on fresh gossip. His gaze darts over all four of us, clustered in the middle of otherwise empty classroom before settling on Nate. Why would anybody want to trap a bunch of students with mostly spotless records in detention? Seems like the sort of thing, oh, I don't know, a guy who's here all the time might do for fun? I look at Nate but can't picture it. Bringing detention sounds like work, and everything about Nate, from his messy dark hair to his ratty leather jacket, screams can't be bothered. Or yawns it, maybe. He meets my eyes but doesn't say a word, just tips his chair back even farther. Another millimeter and he'll fall right over. Cooper sits up straighter, a frown crossing his Captain America face. Hang on, I thought this was just a mix-up, but if the same thing happened to all of us, it's someone's stupid idea of a prank. And I'm missing baseball practice because of it. He says it like he's a heart surgeon being detained from a life-saving operation. Mr. Avery rolls his eyes. <sighs> Save the conspiracy theories for another teacher. I'm not buying it. You all know the rules against bringing phones to class, and you broke them. He gives Simon an especially sore glance. Teachers know about that exists, but there's not much they can do to stop it. Simon only uses inner tail to identify people and never talks openly about school. Now listen up. You are here until 4. I want each of you to write a 500-word essay on how technology is ruining American high schools. Anyone who can't follow the rules gets another detention tomorrow. What do we write with? Eddie asks. There aren't any computers here. Most classrooms have Chromebooks, but Mr. Every, who looks like he should have retired a decade ago, is a holdout. Mr. Every crosses to Eddie's desk and taps the corner of a lined yellow notepad. We all have one. Explore the magic of long handwriting. It's a lost art. Eddie's pretty hard shaped faces in a mask of confusion. But how do we know when we read 500 words? Count, Mr. Every replies. His eyes drop to the phone I'm still holding. And hand that over, Miss Rogers. Doesn't the fact that you're confiscating my phone twice give you pause? Who has two phones? I ask. Nate grins so quickly I almost miss it. Seriously, Mr. Avery, somebody was playing a joke on us. Mr. Avery's snowy mustache twitches in annoyance, and he extends his hand with a beckoning motion. Phone, Miss Rogers, unless you want a return visit. I give it over with a sigh as he looks disapprovingly at the others. The phones I took from the rest of you earlier are in my desk. You'll get them back after detention. Addie and Cooper exchange amused glances, probably because your actual phones are safe in your backpacks. Mr. Avery tosses my phone into a drawer and sits behind the teacher's desk, opening a book as he prepares to ignore us for the next hour. I pull out a pen, tap it against my yellow notepad, and contemplate the assignment. Does Mr. Avery really believe technology is ruining schools? That's a pretty sweeping statement to make over a few contraband phones. Maybe it's a trap and he's looking for us to contradict him instead of agree. I glance at Nate. He spent over his notepad writing computer stuff over and over in block letters. It's possible I'm overthinking this. Cooper, Monday, September 24, 3 5 p.m. My hand hurts within minutes. It's pathetic, I guess, but I can't remember the last time I wrote anything longhand. Plus, I'm using my right hand, which never feels natural no matter how many years I've done it. My father insisted I learn to write right handed in second grade after he first saw me pitch. Your left arm's gold, he told me. Don't waste it on the crap that don't matter. Which is anything but pitching as far as he's concerned. That was when he started calling me Cooperstown, like the Baseball Hall of Fame. Nothing like putting a little pressure on an eight-year-old. Simon reaches for his backpack and roots around, unzipping every section. He hovers his onto his lap and peers inside. Where the hell's my water bottle? No talking, Mr. Gellar. 
Mr. Avery says without looking up. I know, but my water bottle's missing and I'm thirsty. Mr. Avery points toward the sink at the back of the room. It's counter crowded with beakers and petri dishes. Get yourself a drink, quietly. Simon gets up and grabs a cup from his stack on the counter, filling it with water from the tap. He heads back to his seat and puts the cup on his desk, but seems distracted by Ma Nate's methodological writing. Dude, he says, kicking the sneaker against the leg of Nate's desk. Seriously, did you put those phones in our backpack to mess with us? Now Mr. Avery looks up, frowning. I said quietly, Mr. Kelleher. Nate leans back and crosses his arms. Why would I do that? Simon shrugs. Why do you do anything? So you'll have company for whatever your screw up for the day was? One more word from either of you and it's detention tomorrow. Mr. Avery warns. Simon opens his mouth anyway. But before he can speak, there is a sound of tires squealing. And then the crash of two cars hitting each other. Addie grabs and I brace myself against my desk like somebody just rear-ended me. Nate, who looks glad for the interruption, is the first on his feet toward the window. Who gets into a fender bender in the school parking lot, he asks. Rowan looks at Mr. Avery like she's asking for permission, and when he gets up from his desk, she heads for the window as well. Addie follows her, and I finally unfold myself from my seat. Might as well see what's going on. I lean against the ledge to look outside, and Simon comes up beside me with a desperating laugh as he surveys the scene below. Two cars, an old red one and a nondescript grey one, are smashed into each other at the right angle. We all stare at them in silence until Mr. Avery lets out an extra parated sigh. I'd better make sure no one was hurt. He runs his eyes over all of us and zeroes in on Brownway, the most responsible of the bunch. Miss Rogers, keep this room contained until I get back. Okay, Brownman says, casting a nervous glance towards Nate. We stay at the window, watching the scene below, but before Mr. Avery or another teacher appears outside, both cars start their engine and drive out of the parking lot. Well, that was anticlimactic, Simon says. He heads back to his seat and picks up the cup. But instead of sitting here, wanders to the front of the room and scans the periodic table of element posters. He leans out into the hallway like he's about to leave. But then he turns around and raises his cup like he's toasting us. Anyone else want some water? I do, Addie says, slipping into a chair. Get it yourself, princess, Simon smirks. Addie rolls her eyes and status put hold Simon leans against Mr. Avery's desk. Literally, huh? What will you do with yourself now that your homecoming's over? Big gap between now and senior prom. Addie looks at me without answering. I don't blame her. Simon's train of thoughts never goes anywhere good when it comes to our friends. He acts like he's above caring whether he's popular. But he was pretty smug when he sounds upon junior prom count last spring. I'm still not sure how he pulled that, unless he traded keeping secret for votes. Simon was nowhere to be found on homecoming count last week, though I was voted king, so maybe I'm next on his list to harass or whatever the hell he's doing. What's your point, Simon? I asked, taking a seat next to Eddie. Eddie and I aren't close exactly, but I kind of feel protective of her. She's been dating my best friend since freshman year, and she's a sweet girl. Also not the kind of person who knows how to stand up to a guy like Simon who just won't quit. She's a princess and you're a jock, he says. He thrusts his chin towards Brownman, then at Nate. And you're a brain and you're a criminal. You're all walking teen movie stereotypes. What about you? Brownman asks. She's been hovering near the window, but now goes to her desk and perches on top of it. She crosses her legs and pulls her dark ponytail over one shoulder. Something about her is cuter this near. New glasses, maybe? Longer hair? All of a sudden, she's kind of working this sexy nerd thing. I'm the omniscient narrator, Simon says, Bronwyn's brows right up above her black veins. frames. There is no such thing in teen movies. Ah, but Bronwyn, Simon winks and shrugs his water in one long gulp. There is such a thing in life. He says it like a threat, and I wonder if he's got something on Bronwyn for that stupid app of his. I hate that thing. Almost all of my friends have been on it at one point or another. And sometimes it causes real problems. My buddy Lewis and his girlfriend broke up because of something Simon wrote. 
Though it was a true story about Louis hooking up with his girlfriend's cousin, but still, that stuff doesn't have to be published. Hallway gossip is bad enough. And if I'm being honest, I'm pretty freaked at what Simon could write about me if he puts his mind to it. Simon holds his cup up, grimacking. This tastes like crap. He drops the cup and I took my eyes at his attempt at drama. Even when he falls to the floor, I still think he's messing around. But then the whistling starts. Bronwyn's on her feet first, then kneeling beside him. Simon, she says, shaking his shoulder. Are you okay? What happened? Can you talk? Her voice goes from concern to panicky. And that's enough to get me moving. But Nate's faster, showing past me and crushing next to Bronwyn. A pen, he says. His eyes scanning Simon's brick red face. You have a pen? Simon is widely, his hand crawling at the throat. I grab the pen off my desk and try to hand it to Nate, thinking he's about to do some emergency trachotomy or something. Nate just stares at me like I have two heads. An epinephrine pen, he says, searching for Simon's backpack. He's having an allergic reaction. Addie stands and wraps her arms around her body, not saying a word. Bronwyn turns to me, face flushed. I'm going to call a teacher and call 911. Stay with him, okay? She grabs her phone out of Mr. Avery's drawer and runs into the hallway. I kneel next to Simon. His eyes are bugging out of his head. His lips are blue and he's making horrible choking noises. Nate dumps the entire content of Simon's backpack on the floor and scrabbles through the mess of books, papers, and clothes. Simon, where do you keep it? He asks, tearing open all the small phone compartments and yanking out two regular pens and a set of keys. Simon's way past talking, though. I put one sweaty palm on his shoulders, like that'll do any good. You're okay. You're gonna be okay. We're getting help. I can hear my voice slowing thickening like molasses. My accent always comes out hard when I'm stressed. I turn to Nate and ask, you sure he's not choking on something? Maybe he needs a hay millage. Maneuver, not a freaking medical pen.